stations on paper, pretty much like the restation goes, except we don't collaborate on the quiz, about half an hour, and the grading is not really black and white. It's a real grading for it, okay? But the quiz have the same problems like the recitations. Like if you feel like you can transform from binary into octal and, and you know, tools complement and stuff like that, that's the same kind of problem you're gonna get in the quiz. Uh, I would expect six problems, five minutes each type of thing. So now it's, uh, you, you start the recording? Yeah. Oh, very good. So now uh, we should uh, do a very quick recap of what happened last time and then uh, we'll, we'll take it from there. So uh, I had before, so we had a Boolean algebra. And uh, recap, I'm looking for if I have A and B, and there's a bunch of possibilities for them. Uh, that is 0, 0, uh, 1, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1. Uh, Boolean algebra refers to Boolean variables, the true or false. True is 1, false is 0. And we talked about A and B. He said this is N. So uh, that was 0, 0, 0, and 1. And we talked about SOAR. Let's, let's actually put here 9. So that's not A and B. So that would be the opposite, 1, 1, 1, 0. And then we have on the other side, or, which is A or B, or, uh, that is 0, 1, 1, 1. Or is 1 when at least one of them is 1. And then we have SOAR. Um, which is one exactly when one of them is one. That was where we left last time. And we have these cool gates, right? Uh, and, so let me see here. And was this way, around one, right? None is like an end then uh, it's uh, passing through a negation gate <coughs> or is uh, <coughs> or is the, the fancy one that's a little like a bracket right? sometimes people this one put a dot and this one plus that's not really necessary and then, um, here we have a sword. We'll, we'll get to this one in a second. Um, so what I want to do today, to start today with, is uh, a piece of a circuit that goes into processors. It's a very basic, basic stuff, but that's how processors uh, kind of operate. So we're going to do first what's called a half adder. That's for addition. Um, so what we have is A, B, those are the inputs. And then uh, those, of course, can be, every time we write the truth table, we write the all possibilities. And then we have the result. Sometimes we call the result output. And the result consists in two bits, the sum bit and the carry bit. So sum, this is the sum or printed bit. And this is the carry bit that goes to the next column. This is the regular addition. Um, that, that we've been looking at in binary. So when I add 0 to 0, I get sum 0 and carry 0. When I add 1 to 0, I get sum 1 and carry 0. zero. When I get 0, 1, it's 1 and carry zero. 0. And when I get 1, 1, I get 
This is all zero, that's the bit I'm printing, and the carry of one. So how can I implement <coughs> this with a circuit? Um, well, we, uh, first of all, I have a DNF construction. Uh, that's a formula, right? Injunction normal form. So I'm going to say uh, this is not A and B or So I need two things. I need the S bit and I need the C bit, right? There's going to be two formulas in there. A and not B. And carry bit is A and B. Let's verify that this is correct. So I think this one's easy. Carry bit as, as a function of these two bits, right? That's the input. You can easily say, it's one only when both of them are one, right? So that will be the end. In the other three cases, it's zero. I don't want to waste time on it, but if you feel like we're getting stuck, please stop me, okay? Otherwise, I'm going to go a little faster. Now this one, how did I come up with this or that? Yes? You look at the cases where the result is one. I look at the ones, and I say, where is this one? Well, this one corresponds to A and not B. That's in here. And then I looked at uh, this one, and this one corresponds to not A and B. How many people follow me here? Okay, good. So I come up with two formulas. Uh, right? Because I need two outputs effectively. When I do this operation, I need the bit that I'm printing, the sum, and I need the bring that I'm carrying, the carry. Uh, this doesn't quite say the story because <coughs> what's missing in this addition? Well, it's true that if I have two bits, they get added that way. But when we do these additions, let, let me try one addition really quick here to have a uh, uh, six. Uh, so I'm going to do uh, 1, 0, 1, and then 0, 1, 1. 1 plus 1, 0, that's a carry. 1 plus 0 plus 1, 0, that's a carry. And then 1 plus 1 plus 0, 0, and the carry, right? Am I doing this right? So where, where did this stuff work? Where, where this half other exactly like it's in there that applied here? Yes. When you're not adding the carries. Right, so that worked for the first bit here, right? Because it produces what? This was A, this was B, this was the sum, and this carry here was the C, right? So I got two bits, I produced the sum and the carry, and that was my operation. That was the half other. Well, what happened next? I moved to the next bit, right? I moved to this bit. On this bit, is it like that? Can I apply the half other to this second bit? Why not? I have a carry input in here. So in this second column, is not just the carry output that I'm going to produce, but the input to this second column is not just A and B. There is a carry from the previous operation. So the half other it's kind of a nice principle, but in practice, I don't have two inputs. I have A and B, but I have a third input, possible a carry from the previous operation. Okay? So before we do that, I want to uh, uh, drive, drive here um, a circuit that does this. So I'm going to do A, and then the typical thing is uh, create all the possible inputs here. So that's B and then not B. I showed you this last time. Because once we have these wires, we can do everything we want to them. So how do I get this S? What do I have to do to create a circuit for S? 
Yes. Uh, you can buy not A and B. Okay, so not A and B, right? Here, not, not A. I put this dot to make it look like a connection. <coughs> so not A, and then who else? B, right? B, yeah. Yeah, into a gate, right? What gate? Uh, the end gate. An end gate. That's the end gate. And then the output of that, uh, I, have an, I need another gate here, right? A and not B. Yeah. So I take the A wire, and the not B wire, and then I create another end gate. This is this in here. So this this goes into here, and this is this. That's another end gate. And now, what do I have to do with these signals? Whatever's coming. So I can even write on the circuit for my own purpose. What is this? This is uh, not A and B. And what is this? This is A and not B. This is not required, but you know, to, to keep the circuit mentally a note to it, you can write on this wire what you think that wire is. And then what do I have to do with those signals? I have this OR to put between them. So then I'm, I'm doing the OR gate, and this is my formula, not A and B, OR A and not B, which I call S. Right. This is my my S. Um, so how about how about this other output, the C bit? I have to take a wire from A, right? Take it from A, maybe from here. That's A. And the other wire is B. So here's the B wire. And I have to do what with them? Create here an end gate. So that's A and B, which I call C. So this is a circuit that does this formula, which is equivalent to the truth table. Who's with me? Good. The only problem with it is it only works for the first column when there is no input carry. For the, the next column and the next column and the next column, I might have some carry inputs. So how do I modify that? That's why this is called a half other. It's not the full story. How about a, a full story, which is called full Adder. In a full adder, we have three inputs, A, B, and the carry, I'm going to call it carry input or in, that's coming from the previous operation. And what are the possibilities? 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1, right? I get all of them. So they're possibilities. Um, and what are the outputs? So this is the, again, like before, this is the input, and this is the result, or the output. So the result is, like before, two things. I have the S, and I have another C, which is I'm going to call C out. That's the carry that I'm producing. I may be producing one or not. So 0, 0, 0, what's the sum? 0, what's the carry? <coughs> zero, right? 0, 0, 1, what's the sum? 1. one. And the carry? Zero. zero. 0, 1, 0, the sum is 1, carry is 0. zero. zero 1, 1, sum is 0, right? And the carry is 1, 0, 0, 1, and 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and the carry is 1, 1, 1, 0, again 0, and the carry is 1, and finally 1, 1, 1 is 1, and the carry is So um, while I'm going a little fast here, I hope everybody understands the difference between C input and C output. When I'm at a certain column, like say in this column here, 
uh, right? Who is this carry for me now? This is the input carry. And I'm producing this as the sum output. And I'm producing this carry for the next column. This would be who? This is the output carry. Okay? So I may have an input carry from the previous column. And I'm producing a carry for the next column. Now, how would this look uh, in a, in a D DNF formula? I don't want to write the whole thing, but, uh, but I think you can follow this principle here and say, I have a formula for S, right? So I'm looking at these ones here, and whenever I see a one, I, I read the input. So here's first one. Uh, what's the input here? How do I write this with logical symbol? This one corresponds to, let me just highlight this row in here. So who is this one here? Not A and not B. He's reading these values, not A, not B, and I'm going to say C in. I don't want to get confused with C and C. So that's that. You're missing the end between B and C. I'm missing the end. Very good. What's the next one? This one, right? This one right here. How do I read that input? I, what sign do I put here? Between those formulas. It's an OR, right? So how do I read this? Not A and B and not C, right? So again, where is this coming? Not A, B, and C? It's coming from this input here. These three things. Um, for your first one, it should be just regular C, not not C. What? For your first one, it should just be regular C. Without the not up Very good. I'm going to put dot, 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 and you guys can finish it off. So for everything that I see a one, I create a clause here with ends between them which specify exactly the input ends means it has to be exactly 0, 1, 0. If it's not exactly like that, this doesn't give me a 1. How about the carry out? That is this column. I do the same, right? I look for where the 1's are, like in here. That's a 1. So what, how do I write this 1? Now I'm on this line. I need what? Not A and B and carry in. How do I write, I'm going to select another one, this one. So I'm, I'm focusing on this one. I need the what? A and not B. Uh, sorry, A and B. Okay. A and B and not carry in. Now, of course, this is the way, the easy way to construct those things, because it's very visual. Whatever you see in the input where you have a one, you just write that down. Now, when you work with these formulas, like we saw last time, you want to manipulate them, and you're going to simplify them to something much simpler, potentially. Uh, what would be the circuit for this? So let's let's draw draw a circuit here. I'm gonna keep it here. Um, I'm gonna, like before, I'm gonna uh, drive the, the the lines. This is A. This is not A. Then there's a B. Not B. And there is a C input. Now I have a third line and a not C. That's not C input. So those are my lines. And how do I? Um, I could simplify those maybe, but I don't have the time to do that right now. And if I simplify them, there'll be simpler formula. But those formulas are not bad, they're not wrong, so I'm gonna try to implement them. How do I do not A and not B and C? Uh, I go to 
not A, here, not B, here, and C, here. That's my first gate. Not A, not B, and C input. So I make an end out of it. And that's my first gate. I could even write on it. Not A, not B, and C input. I have another one here, which is not A and B and not C. Not A and B and not C. And gate not A and B and not C. Uh, and then I have other gates. And what do I do with those? Potentially I have two more gates here because this formula is gonna have this corresponds to a one, this corresponds to the second one. The two more ones will be two more formulas here. All this stuff goes into an OR gate. OR comes from the fact that there's ORs between them. <coughs> so this is an OR gate. Which is going to give me uh, the signal S. <coughs> if I repeat this process with these gates, not A, B and C. <coughs> Those dots are useful because sometimes helps reading what lines are connected, what does not connected. If you don't put a dot, well, in principle, you can still see when this line ends, it makes it clear that this is not a connection, what well, this one is. So this is an end gate here. That's uh, not A and B and C in, and then I have here A, A and B, it's A and B, and not C, I'm going to get it right from here, like that, and then A, A and B, not C in, and there's two other gates here because this formula will have four inputs. And when I drive this into an OR gate, I'm getting the C out. Okay, that's called a full adder, because now this works on all the columns. Right? I may have as many, as many columns I want. This will just take the input from the, the C out, becomes the C in to the next column, and then that's the out becomes in the next <coughs> column all the way through. So what people do when they build up the circuits on paper, they say, I'm going to come up with some sort of symbol for this whole thing. So if I'm going to say this, I'm going to, this drawing here, if I don't want to repeat it, I'm going to uh, create a symbol, you know, <coughs> which is, for example, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to draw a square like that. And I'm going to say, this is getting two inputs A and B. Also, it's getting uh, a C in, so those are inputs. And uh, it's called full other. It's like Intel writes on their chips, you know. Intel Core 7, right? that's how we're gonna write here, full adder. That's the thing that does that. And what it produces, it produces S, that's an output. And what else? C out. So the last one I wanna show you here is uh, the entire operation of addition, ripple carry adder which does the whole operation for all columns. Because this one still, while it works for every column, it's only one column, right? It's only one bit. It's in the shadow. In the shadow. I'm just a title, sorry. Um, how are we doing with this monitor? I, I thought it's in the, 
it's in the video too much. Right. I think if you, that's a good exercise, I think. Uh, you should figure out that this formula here, before I go to the circuit, I can simplify and get something simple. Right. That's what you're saying? Do you have the formula there? The form answer, but not the form. Okay. It would be nice to have the formula write it down. But I can like, write it here. See if you can figure out the formula. So a ripple carry adder, it's a bunch of this stuff. It's a bunch of full adders. So how they work? Uh, this is the, like, the last bit. That's where we start the addition. So there's a full adder that says takes what? Takes the last A and the last B. These are like, let's see here. If we have A1, um, A2, all the way to A, say, 8, 8 bits, and then B1, B2, all the way to B8, right, to add. I'm just saying that in abstract. This is the A8 and B8 inputs. So they get plugged into the full adder here. And of course, I have no carry because I'm the first column, right? So there's no carry. What am I going to output? I'm outputting the S8 bit, right? That's the S8 sum, and this is S7, and so on and so forth. And I'm also outputting the carry out, which is, if you like, the C8. Whatever, if I have a carry, it's going to go in the second column here, C8, if I have a carry. So now this <coughs> gets inputted into what? Let me, this is C8. So this is the <coughs> next full adder, which does the operation for bit seven, which is one takes, takes this carry that the previous operation has output as a carry, <coughs> it takes it as an input, right? Also takes what? What bits? A7 and B7, right? That's the next bits right here, A7 and B7. And it produces the stuff that I'm printing, S7, and then the carry 7, which is an output for this other, but it's gonna go in as an input for the next other. That's full other 6, which takes A6 and B6. This carry from the previous operation, output S6, that's the value that I'm gonna have here. But also outputs C6, which is a carry for the fifth adder. So I have another adder here, which is taking A, what, five, B5, carry six, so this is S5, and um, C5. And uh, you can keep going like this. How many of those others I need? Hmm? Eight. Eight, right? So I'm going to have to have eight full others here. And that circuit now, where each box stands for this, right? Because I, I, just, I just draw that box instead of drawing this circuit, I could have drawn this circuit eight times. Now, does addition bit by bit. Where are you using the full adder to the first one if you don't have a carry yet? Right, right. I could use a half adder for the, that's a correct observation. I could use a half adder here. That would work. Uh, I guess when I'm implementing it in silicon, we, we don't want to have, you know, it's just full adders and it's just get one after the other, right? That's a good observation. We could have used uh, Now, this is a very basic thing that if you be an engineering class, you could actually do the wires and the building, and you can actually see how bit by bit the addition is going to work in this thing. Of, of course, transistors are much more complicated than this, and there's billions of them in a, in, a, in a CPU. But that's the basic principle of how those things are built. Uh, do you want to? You have a formula for S or for C or for both? For both. Let's see. S is AXOR, B, XOR, C, I. Say again. A, XOR, B, and the whole XOR, C, I. So like C, XOR. 
XOR C input, right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, the C output? Yes. A and B. A whole or? Or? So A, XOR, B, and? XOR here? No, it's A and. So then like a P bracket or like a? Like that? Yeah. And then like or. Or. And then a huge bracket. And um, A X R B. And like inside that bracket, I draw C F. No, sorry, and C F. But like it's a. Uh, Why don't you write it down, huh? Um, yeah. This is the same yeah. formula. <laughs> Simplified. So something for you to check out. Is this formula, I didn't write it, don't blame me if it's wrong, right? She did. <laughs> so is this the same as that? And is this the same as that? You can verify it in two ways. You can either draw the truth table, right? And then check the truth table will have in this case how many rows? Eight. Eight rows. You check the output of this, which we already have. And the output of that, if it's the same on all eight rows, means they add the same formula because they give the same one and zeros. Or you can use those manipulation of the formulas we put up <coughs> last time, like the Morgan rules and distribution of ends over ors or ors over ends, and you might get this. They, they, they write in the sense that if you get a formula like this, the circuit will be easier, right? If this formula, I don't have to implement that many AND gates and OR gates and, and stuff like that, right? Um, so that's good. Are we all good with this? <coughs> so this is easy. I mean, I would say very easy, but a little messy, as in, <coughs> It's not a lot of intellectual thinking, honestly, into this stuff. But it's easy to make mistakes on all counts, on drawing those tables, they're long and boring, and you know, occasionally you're gonna put one of this stuff wrong, right? On the formulas, the same, you, again, the, the, how it works, if somebody shows to you, it's easy to follow, but it's, it's prone to mistakes if those formulas are big and you make one operation wrong. Same thing with the circuit. You can easily drive one wire that's off and then the circuit is important. So I, I know it's easy to follow, but when you do those, you, you gotta take your time to make sure you do it correctly. So we're gonna move on to something following up, which is uh, how do we take all these and make a more abstract statement, which is about logic. How do we uh, take all this Boolean algebra, if you'd like, and make mathematical, logical arguments out of it. So this is kind of a transition, and uh, we're going to... Um, and we're going to make the transition than just Boolean algebra. <coughs> we, need, we need quite a few things, but Boolean algebra is one of them. So we're going to need some new symbols and a little bit of, uh, let's call it logic basics, as in, uh, for example, something that's called implication.
Um, so before I do this, um, I start with the say, let me erase this part so I don't have it. this S here, and uh, I could add a column that is not S, which is very easy to, to add it here. Uh, of course, I look at this column, I negate it, 1, 0, 0, 1, right? And uh, I'm going to say, uh, who is S? S that I want here computed, I'm going to say that's not not S. That's my first logical statement. It uses a little bit of logic that says if you take something and you make a not out of it, now you obtain a new variable or statement. If you not it again, you obtain back the original. Um, so then. How do I take this, uh, so the output here, not S, these two ones, right? Not A and not B. So this one here is not A and not B. Or <coughs> the other one is A and B, right? Now, S, it's not not S, so S, it's not not S, so it's going to be not this, not A and not B, or A and B. <coughs> How does not distribute over ors, not orange or apple? What does it become? If I have a not, orange, or apple. Not orange. Not orange. Yeah, not, apple. not orange. That's not the orange. And or becomes an end. And not the apple. Now that's another logic principle is one of those De Morgan rules, I think, or the negation rule. But uh, my point here is to think of it in logical terms, not in a formula terms. Why not orange or apple becomes not orange and not apple? It's like saying if, if you're going to eat either an orange or an apple, the negation of that, the, the, the situation in which orange or apple is false, so that the negation gives me true, when it's false that I'm not eating an orange or not eating an apple. Well, if I'm eating either one of them, that statement will be true. So for it to not be true, I have to not eat the orange and not eat an apple. Mm -hmm. Because if either the orange or the apple are true, the statement is true, and I need it to be false because when this is false, that gives me true. So further, I think uh, we get how does not distribute now towards an end. There's another rule, but we want to think now in logical terms. If I negate this and that, I'm going to end up with not not A or not not B. Right? Because negation of and becomes an or. And not A or B, right? Not, or not, not, B. B. not B. So now not, not A is A, A or B, and not A 
<coughs> is that correct? Looks correct. And this is called a CNF formula, conjunctive normal form. Uh, when it has ends in between or clauses, as opposed to the DNF formula that has ors between end clauses. So that's a DNF formula here. That's a CNF formula. So I could come up with a logical way of thinking that says, instead of looking at S, this is an example. I looked at not not S because I know not not S is going to produce S. And instead of constructing a formula for S directly, like I did here, I'm constructing a formula for not S, and then I negate that formula, and I use some rules to get it to a simple form. So, this is where we start building a little bit of logic. But we're going to need a few things. So uh, one thing that we need, let's do the basics here. Uh, one, we need the implication. That is like the absolute backbone of, of logic. Uh, and we're going to call it something like A implies B. So this we read implies. Now there's many names informal for this. We could say results in. Or um, infers to. Or um, we could say, actually, I want to say this more like a definition. If A, then B. I could say that. That means the same thing. Uh, I could say, um, here's another one. B, if A, means the same. Um, or what, what are the names I can give to this? From A, I can prove B. Um, there's, again, quite a few names for how this works informally. And in this class, informal is fine. In a math department, it's not. But in here, if you don't like the word implies, you prefer something like this, that's fine. But the, the typical formal word for this is implies. Now, why is this such a backbone for logic of all kinds? This is a Boolean statement. So I can call it, uh, if I want, say, a statement, the whole statement. I could say that is statement C. So Boolean statement or variable. Now, A and B are Boolean variables, right? So A and B are Boolean variables. And then I have C, also a Boolean variable. C is the same as A implies B. Sometimes when we say same in logic, we mean the same meaning. We don't put the equal sign. You need something? No, I just can't see. OK. Sorry about that. So sometimes you're going to see this sign, which means same meaning or truth value. I don't like that sign personally, but if you see it in a book or you know somebody else writes it, it means has the same logical meaning truth value. Sometimes people would just A and say, you know, C is really A implies B. But the important thing here is to distinguish between the Boolean variable A, the Boolean variable B, and the statement or variable, which is also Boolean, C, which is neither A or B. A implies B is a new Boolean statement. It's like the others, true or false. 
So the mistake a lot of people do is to say, if this is true, then A is true. Uh, if, if uh, let, me, let me try an example here. A is, uh, I make a lot of money, or when I make a lot of money. And B is, I buy off, pay off my mortgage. Many people want to do that, right? Make a lot of money so they pay off their houses. Sounds like a goal for a lot of people. Good. Is A implies B a reasonable statement? If I make a lot of money, I can, <coughs> let's ask to be more English correct, I can in there, I can pay off my mortgage. That does sound reasonable to you? I, I mean as an intuition. Now, you can make a lot of money and you bought such a big house that you could still not pay it off. I I'm not talking about that. Implication seems reasonable here. I make a lot of money. I, I um, you know, uh, pay off my house. I could say another example, I finish school with good grades, it's easier to get a job. Makes sense. Now, my point, which is critical, is that this is true, we're gonna say true, but is either A or B true, necessarily? So this may be true all the time. Whoever makes a lot of money can pay off their house. A true statement. But it doesn't mean anybody or everybody in particular makes a lot of money. It also doesn't mean anybody or everybody pays off their houses. So the, for the fact A implies B to be true, it doesn't mean A has to be true or B has to be true necessarily. It only means if a is true, then B is true. I know it sounds a little weird if you haven't seen, who has seen this kind of stuff before? Okay, about half a class. It requires, it, it's, it may sound weird, it may require us to go home into the recitation and, and, and practice a little bit with this stuff. But that's a confusion quite typical for everybody, me, myself, anybody, no matter how smart. When they see this for the first time, it's like, wait a minute, that doesn't mean A is true? No, it doesn't. A is not necessarily true. It doesn't mean B is true either. It's the implication that is true. So we're gonna build a little truth table here to see how this works. I have my typical four cases, right? This is the result. Uh, what is this, if A then B? So if A is true, then B is true. So which one is that? Literally, if A is true, then B is true. Which one of those lines is that? The last one. So that means if one is one, then this is correct or true. Because true implies true, right? How about this one? If A is true, then B is false. This is saying if I make a lot of money, I cannot pay off my mortgage. How is that? That's false. That's the part that makes sense. I know everybody could have figured out this without me saying anything. The part that's a little weird is in here. Right? This is called a premise. I should say here. A is the premise of the implication. Every implication has a premise. And B is called what? Conclusion. And this is the implication. <coughs> so uh, implication has a premise and a conclusion. Now if the premise is true, so I'm gonna say here premise in these two cases, the premise is true. <coughs> Most people, everybody would figure out, okay, the premise true has to imply the conclusion true. That's the implication. That's when the implication holds. But what when the premise is false? What is this statement becomes? What, what if the A doesn't hold? So I make a lot of money implies I can pay off my mortgage. 
what if I don't make a lot of money? What can you say about the implication itself? If the A is false, can we say anything? Can we say it's true? Can we say it's false? <coughs> See, that's the weird part that I really need you guys to sit on it. Even if you think you know it. If A is false, life is good. When premise is false, implications hold. So this is always true here. <coughs> When a premise is false, meaning I don't make a lot of money, the statement is still correct, is true, because it doesn't apply to me. <coughs> now, you can think about it this way. Can you prove this statement wrong with people who don't make money? We cannot. To prove it wrong, we need what? Somebody who makes money but can't pay off his house. If people don't make enough money, we can't prove this statement wrong. So this is the part that, again, I really need you to sit down on it, even if you think you got it from like childhood. When the premise is false, the implication is true. So false premise, false A, uh, that's the same as saying not A, or that's the same as saying false premise. Any one of those, which mean the same thing, implies. A implies anything. Doesn't matter what B is. When the premise is false, this implication <coughs> is true. In other words, false implies everything. So when we prove a statement, when we try to make some sort of proof, there's only one A that we need to worry about when we try to prove something, we're going to worry about the case when A is true. true. Because if A is false, the state any, any false implies anything, that's fine. We don't need to prove nothing, right? How about if I make it to the moon? Here's another A, A2. I make it to the moon. <coughs> Literally. How about A2 implies B? If I make it to the moon, I can pay off my mortgage. True or false? Probably true. Again, if I go to the moon, I can pay my mortgage. You could say, hey, it makes no sense, right? Going to the moon or not doesn't help you pay your mortgage. Sounds common sense, reasonable, that people who go to the moon not necessarily can pay their mortgages. Maybe some of them can pay their mortgages, but it's not related to the fact that went to the moon, right? Common sense tells you that. But what is this saying? <coughs> if you actually not going to the moon, then it doesn't matter. You can deduct from there. You can, you can, you can infer everything you want. So if the premise is false, as it happens, I didn't go to the moon, right? Did, did you guys go to the moon? No. Do you know anybody who go to the moon? Well, that, that's a little tricky, right? To make a statement like this, this, these implications have to be universal, right? It refers to not one person, Virgil. It doesn't say if Virgil goes to the moon. It says in general, if a person goes to the moon, if any person, makes it to the moon, then he can pay off the mortgage. Now, is that statement true or false? The premise is false or true? <coughs> false means false for everybody. True means true when it's true. Are there any people who went to the moon? You sure about that? <laughs> is there any person who went to the moon? Not in here, in general. Yeah. 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 Do you think those people could pay off their mortgage because they went to the moon? Yeah. yeah. But they're both related. I don't think going to the moon means they, 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 they pay off their mortgages. He went to the moon though? Yeah. 
So she's making the case that there's another implications in between. There is a, not directly A to B. She's proving that there is another Boolean statement that makes B working. He's saying astronauts get rich because they make speeches and people listen to them. And then if you are an astronaut going to the moon, then you're rich. And if you're rich, you can buy off your house. OK, be before we move on, of course, it's, a, it's an exaggerated example. I want to emphasize the fact that uh, A may be false all the time, or always false for everybody. And then in that case, the whole statement is true. So before I, I know there was a question there, but before I, I go there, I want to come up with the third A3 statement. If I make it, or a person, makes it or goes to the sun, <laughs> not to the moon. Because to the moon, it's not always false. It's not a false premise. People have, have gone to the moon, right? But how about to the sun? Is A3 going to imply now B? Is that statement going to be true? Why is it going to be true? Because no one went to the sun, and no one will go to the sun, I think. So I'm going to say that's true. <laughs> Why is it true? Because this is a false premise. So back to our world here. When this is false, the statement is true. If you have to prove something and you already proved that the hypothesis or premise is not holding, that's it, you're done. From there, you can conclude everything. So if the premise is always false, do you just ignore the bottom half of the truth? Right, so if the premise is false, you're done proving that, because false implies everything. That's why when we prove something, we only worry about the cases when the premise is true. In fact, we use the premise in the proof. We count on it to be true, because if it's false, we don't, we don't care about it. Most theorem says, if something happens, then blah, blah, blah. So we only, about the care, we only care about the case when that something happens. If it doesn't happen, the theorem holds all the time. It ain't matter what the B side is. When the premise is false, that's what it is. So that's the first thing, implication. And it's the, the, the backbone, I mean, we have to get it right. There's other things in there that were um, equivalence, for example. So I'm going to say here, two, equivalence. Uh, it's sometimes noted this way, implication both sides, or sometimes, like I said, people call it three lines. I don't like the three lines, so from now on, I'm always going to use the equivalent sign. Uh, sometimes this is called congruent sign. If you like it, you can use it, but I'm always going to use this sign. So when I say A equivalent B, I really mean two things. I mean A implies B and B implies A. So equivalent is implications both ways. So this one saying if A is true, then B is true. This one saying, so if A, then B. This one saying if B, then A. Right? But like this one, it doesn't mean A or B are true. So make sure to understand just like with implications. That statement can be true, but A or B don't have to be true for that. I can have, so if, if I'm to build a truth table, right? A, A, B, and A equivalent B. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. When this stuff holds, 1, 1, true and true is going to hold, right? 1 implies 0 is not going to work. How about 0, 1? In the implication, actually, let's do the implication here too, just 1. So what did we have for implication? This one worked, and these two worked, because in these two, we had the false premise. A was false. When A is false, the, the statement worked. 
the implication. How about in here? In here, I need A to imply B, but also B to imply A. So is 1 imply 0? No. How about 0 and 0? 0 implies 0? Yes. This 0 implies 0? Yes. So that helps. So two statements are equivalent if both they are both true or they are both false. But there's a difference with the implication. Implication works as in false implies truth. That's OK. But for equivalence, it doesn't. Um, so I could write this stuff with, with Boolean formulas. Uh, so I look at this truth table. And um, here's the formula that I'm going to use here. I'm going to say, uh, and this one is in this row. So I'm going to say, how about not A or B? So I say this, this, this implication is the same as saying A implies B, right here. A implies B have the same truth table as not A or B. And we can easily verify, right? Who is not A or B? Well, it's going to be true either when A is false, so that's a 1, 1, or when B is true. So it's the same truth table, means the, the same. How about the formula for A equivalent B? What is this formula here? <coughs> Not A or B, that's that. Right? And the other way around. Because the equivalence means implication has to hold both ways. A implies B, that's not A or B. And not B implies A, which is? Not B or A. Not B or A. Of course, I can open up these formulas and maybe come up with something else. Uh, if I am to look at the truth values and build the formula, what formula would I get? This one is A, not A, and not B, this case, right? Or where do I else get on one? And here is what? A and B. So this formula should be equivalent to this formula because they mean the same thing. How many people follow me? Good. Now, this has massive logic and proof implications. The fact that implication, when you prove something from there to there, can be written this way. What is this effectively saying? What's the intuition of not A and uh, not A or B in common terms? What is this saying? Either the premise is false, or the conclusion is that's what implication means. Either you started with the impossible thing. So the premise is false, and then we don't care. Or your conclusion must be true. OK? Uh, and we, we can manipulate things. Let, let me give another example before we move on. Because uh, that's, that's written in the, in the book here. Um, about statement A, Oops, how much time we have left? So statement A, it's hot outside. Statement B, uh, uh, there are not many people outside. We say A implies B is true. When it's hot, people tend to not go outside. Okay. That doesn't mean either A or B is true. Making that statement in English, what's that statement? When 
or if it's hot outside, sometimes logically we put a then here, but sometimes in English then doesn't work. We care much more about the logic than the English. So some phrases will be broken to follow the logical statement. Then um, there are not many people out. That's what A implies B means, right? If it's hot, people don't go outside. That is a true statement. You agree with me? I, I hope we can agree on that. However, it doesn't mean it's hot outside right now. Also, it doesn't mean there are not many people outside now or in general. It only says when that happens, also that happens. Um, so again, my point does not necessarily mean A is true or B is true. It could be, could not be. The statement is true whenever the premise is false. So if it's not hot, if it's not hot outside, this is automatically true because the premise is false. So it doesn't matter what says up there. Now we have a notion of converse. That's the third thing that we need to talk about. Converse of a implies B. Some people call it reverse. Please don't do that. <laughs> that means you, you didn't take a math class. Okay? When you see people say reverse, that means they're really bad at math. It's converse, not reverse. So let's not use reverse. Okay. But if you see somebody saying it or writing it, you should know what they mean. They mean the converse. What is the converse of A implies B? Or the reverse? B implies A. B implies A. Now, if A implies B, is it true that B implies A? No. So if I am to write a statement here, if A implies B, then B implies A, I could write the same statement in a different way. I could say A implies B implies B implies A, right? Or the same statement, I could write it with this Boolean formula. A implies B is not A or B. And I could say that implies not B or A. And I can further apply my formula, this formula here, to this implication to say, what does an implication mean? Either the premise is false or the conclusion is true. So I could say that's further the same as, same as, not not A or B, premise being false, <coughs> or conclusion being true, <coughs> not B or A. Those things mean the same thing. I just wrote the same statement in four ways. If A implies B, then B implies A. Or I write it with mass symbols. Or I apply these logical formulas a few times, and I get some Boolean statement. However, all this stuff, which is the same statement written in four ways, same, same, is that true or false? Hmm? This is false. The converse doesn't follow from the direct statement. If A implies B, it doesn't mean B implies A. And we can easily check this with an example, right? Let's take this example, the last example. If there aren't many people outside, that's the B statement, right? This right here is B. And this right here was statement A. So A implies B was saying if it's hot outside, not many people go out. And we said that's true. How about the other way? If there are not many people outside, can we conclude it's hot? So in this case, B implies A is the same as saying if not many people outside, then it's hot. 
Again, this I reverse now. I make B the premise and I make A the conclusion. That is not a true statement. Just use common sense, right? If not many people are outside, there could be a bunch of reasons. It could be freezing, it could be windy, it could be a hurricane, it could be some sort of emergency, who knows? There's so many reasons why in a particular moment there may not be many people outside. But when it happens, it's not necessarily that because it's hot. It could be for other reasons. So in other words, I could have not many people outside <coughs> and not being hot. This is saying, not B and not A is possible. Sorry, I mean to say B. This is saying I can have B and not A. So I can have a true premise in this case and a false conclusion. If my implication would be true, then this would be impossible, right? But this can happen, it means my statement is not working. Who's with me? Okay. Again, we need to spend some time on this stuff. Because when, again, somebody explains it makes sense, but then you're gonna have to do it on your own. So that's the notion of converse, which is not the same as the implication. A lot of people make this mistake. And even as reading a problem statement, instead of reading it A implies B, they read it B implies A, so they prove the other way. But so we'll, we'll, there will be cases where converse is true, right? Or no, it'll always be You are right. So that's when the converse is true and the statement is true, then it's equivalent. Got it. So in this specific case, it happens to be false. In this space, in specific case, it's false. This doesn't imply that it's hot. But there are cases when both implications are correct, A implies B and B implies A, and that's the equivalent case. How about the previous example? <coughs> if I make a lot of money, I can pay off my mortgage. That's A implies B. What is B implies A? If I can pay off my mortgage, I make a lot of money. If I pay off my mortgage, it means then I must have made, or I, I make a lot of money. Is that true? Yes or no? I don't think that's true. I think people pay their mortgages off in 30 years or 35 years or 25 years just by paying little by little with a regular salary, right? And that doesn't mean they necessarily made a lot of money. I mean, I could have a regular job salary, you know, 75,000 a year, little by little pay off my mortgage. I end up owning my house, you know, fair and square, but that doesn't mean I made a lot of money. $75,000 a year doesn't count like a lot of money, right? Does it? By a lot of money, people mean usually more like at least three, 400,000 a year. Kind of a lot of money. Okay? So what that equivalent statements then? Can you give me an example of equivalent statements where they, 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 they correct? I, I want to use an example that's more numerical because these are too open up to interpretation. They serve an intro to logic, but then you could argue what's a lot of money, what's paying off my mortgage, what kind of house you have. And in mathematics, we, we don't deal with that. That's reality. In mathematics, here's another example. Um, so I'm going to say uh, two statements. X, um, X is even uh, integer, and that's a statement A. X is even integer, and statement B is X by 2 is an integer. Now, A implies B reads like what? If x is even, then x by 2 is integer. I'm going to say it belongs to z. z. We all know z is a set of integer numbers. We're going to talk a lot about z starting on Friday. <coughs> How about b implies a? If x by 2 is an integer, then 
I can put the implication sign, x is even. Are both those things true? Are they? An even number I can divide by 2, I get an integer. <laughs> or if x by 2 is an integer, when I multiply by 2, I get an even number. Right? So then both are true, which means I could write the equivalent now. Yes? So the converse is where you switch the places of uh, A and B. But that doesn't always have to be true. So the converse takes the conclusion, yeah. makes it a premise, takes the premise, makes it the conclusion. Right. Now the converse is not necessarily true when the implication is true. <laughs> but the converse could be true and the implication could be false. They are not equivalent. But we want to introduce one that is equivalent <coughs> with the implication. So we have the converse here that is not the same as the implication. And uh, let's write another one that is number four. Contrapositive. So again, the implication is A implies B. The converse is B implies A. We just said that. And the contrapositive <coughs> is not B implies not A. So contrapositive reads these this ones kind of backward. It says, if I make a lot of money, I'm going to pay off my mortgage. What's the contrapositive? If I don't pay off my mortgage, I don't make a lot of money. If I don't pay off my mortgage, I couldn't have possibly made a lot of money because the implication says, if I made money, I'd have to pay off my mortgage. I didn't pay my mortgage, therefore, I couldn't have made a lot of money. That's the meaning of the contrapositive. So contrapositive is saying logically as the implication. So we said implication is what? We say it's not A or B, right? We have here some implication is not A or B. And that's to say, again, what was our common informal sense of this is saying either premises false or the conclusion is true. What is in the same way, this is still an implication technically between different things. What is this in the same way? So that's an implication. What is the contrapositive? Either the premise is false or the conclusion You guys following me? I'm going to apply this rule here to the contrapositive, and I'm going to say either the premise is false or the conclusion is true. What's the premise here? No. Not B. Okay. So this is, uh, I'm going to write it first in English. <coughs> false premise or true conclusion. So how do I write that with symbols now? False premise is not, not B, right? Because the premise was not B, so not, not B. Or true conclusion, not A. Are those the same thing? Those two things? What's not, not B? B. That is B or not A. Same as not A or B. What is the converse? Also an implication. So those are the same. You can check them out. Those, those things are the same thing. But what about the converse? Why is the converse not the same as those two? If I write that with my formula, false premise, again, false premise or true conclusion. What does that mean for B implies A? Who's the premise? A. 
to B. So false premise means not B, or true conclusion is A. The thing is, not B or A is the different logical statement than not A or B. It doesn't have the same truth table. That's why the converse and the implications are not the same. While the contrapositive and the implication are the same. Contrapositives gives us a way of proving things. <coughs> Making proofs. It's saying, instead of proving A implies B, because you're going to have this exercise from now on, you know, like until the rest of the term, until the rest of your life, you're going to have to deal with A implies B in computer science or mathematics. What this is saying, instead of proving A implies B, you could instead prove something else, which is not B implies not A. Those kind of proofs are called proof by no, not induction, contradiction. Proving by contradiction means that instead of proving the implication, I'm proving the contrapositive. Right? You ever see this proof? I have to prove I have to prove A implies B. And how the proof starts? Suppose how the proof starts by contradiction. Let's suppose what? How many people have seen a proof by contradiction so far? Okay, so how does the proof start? If I say I want to prove A implies B, right? So A implies B, let me see here, proof by contradiction, recipe, how, how this works. So I want the theorem that says A implies B. Now I say proof. How that proof goes? What do I do the first thing when I prove by contradiction? I say, suppose, what? B is false. B is false. <laughs> That's the same as saying, not B, true. Right? And then I do a bunch of mathematics with implications, right, with derivations, with derivatives and Newton's, whatever, some sort of mathematics. And I conclude at some point, what? I, I started with assume B is false, blah, 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 blah. I conclude what? That A is false, which is essentially saying not A is true. So I just proved the contrapositive. Not B implies not A. So contradictions, why is this a contradiction? Where's the contradiction word coming from? Why is A true? That's where I started. Again, when we prove this thing, we assuming A is true, right? So when I say, but A is true, as a premise, then I get the contradiction. So you can think of them as contradiction proof, or you can think of them as simply, instead of proving A implies B, I'm going to prove not B implies not A. Those being equivalent statements, either one of them does the job. So this, this fact gives us a way to proving things. Um, can you also start with something like A and not B and then get something itself like C and not C? A and not B? Right. If A and not B, um, right, I want to prove A implies B. I'm assuming A is true. That's what he's saying. I can start to, let's assume A is true and B is false. That's effectively like this, because this is saying B is false here, and it's also using A is true. So it's using the same two facts. Let's assume B is false and A is true, and then I'm proving 
an impossible thing, like one equals zero, or two is bigger than five, or something like that. And that's clearly a false statement. So in this class, we care more about good thinking, intuition, and common sense than mathematical rigorosity. Now, you still have to use symbols and signs, but the emphasis is in thinking correctly, not in the formalism. Um, does it work the other way? So if A implies B, does that imply that not if B implies not A? Yeah. Like right. That's what we said, right? A implies B is the same as saying <laughs> not B implies not A. We say the contrapositive and the implication are the same. <coughs> The equivalent. If you prove not B implies not A, or what he said, not B and A fo false, or A implies B, that means the same. But be worried, be careful about proving this other thing, B implies A, or not A implies not B, which is its contrapositive, which is a different statement. That's a question? No. All right. Um, Here's um, here's a keep. How, how do we keep going with, with this stuff? How do we keep building up? Um, there's plenty of those examples in the book, and we're gonna post some online. Um, here's one or three variables. We're gonna say. Uh, I'm going to use different names just so, so you guys can see a different notation, but they all work like variables. I'm going to use P, Q, and R are my variables, they're boolean. Um, I'm going to say if um, <coughs> statements here, P true, Q true, and P and Q imply R, then all three are true. That's a P and Q and R are true. So P and Q and R is a logical statement. For this to be true, then all three have to be true. Now, of course, I already have P is true and Q is true. So what do I need to prove? That R is true, right? So I can do this with uh, logical symbols. I'm gonna say P and Q, and I have this. P and Q implies R. I'm gonna write here same as, but for now, but normally I put the equivalent sign those things. Um, I'm going to rewrite this with my formula that was saying A implies B is the same as saying not A or B. False premise for true conclusion. So I'm going to apply that formula here so I get P and Q and how do I apply this formula here? What's the premise in here? P and Q. So I say not P and Q. What's the conclusion? R, right? So I've applied the formula saying either the premise is false or the conclusion is true. Who's with me? OK, so now I, I have manipulated symbols. I'm going to put the equivalent <coughs> sign here. I'm going to say I look at this as a whole, P and Q, and I open up the parentheses. Right? I use the formula an orange and an apple or a plum. Right? So orange and apple or plum. What's the result of this formula? 
orange and apple, that's one piece, or orange and plum. So what does that mean for me? P and Q, right? And not P and Q, that's orange and the apple. Or, that's this or from here. Now I have orange and the plum. So that is P and Q and R. Now, what do I have here? If P and Q is the orange, this is orange and not orange. How much is orange and not orange? False. That's false. False or P and Q and R, which of course is P and Q and R. False or something is that something. So there'll be some abstract logic manipulations like this. But again, for me, it's more important that you have the right thinking, the right intuition, which is not these manipulations. The intuition is if P is true and Q is true, and when they are both true, R is also true, that's what this implication is saying. If those two are true, then R is true. Then you can see why all three are true. Those are given to be true, and because they are true, they make R true, therefore all three are true. I can also have chaining. Uh, P is Friday afternoon. Q is bad traffic. R is going to be late. What's the implication here between those things? The implication is P implies Q, right? If it's Friday afternoon, there's gonna be bad traffic. In any city like Boston, that's an absolute given <coughs> statement, unless there's a holiday or something. And if there's traffic, I'm gonna be late, right? And Q implies R. That, again, doesn't mean yet that any one of those P or Q or R are true. It doesn't mean it's Friday afternoon, it doesn't mean it's bad traffic, and it doesn't mean I'm gonna be late. But if P is true, then Q is true. And if Q is true, then R is true. So I could say, if P, then Q, and R, right? Because P kind of starts this whole chain. As soon as Friday afternoon hits, the other two are gonna happen, right? So I could write this as P implies Q implies R, or I could write it as P implies all three, P and Q and R. Because once I have P Friday afternoon, the other two are gonna happen. Now, again, doesn't mean this is true. They mean it's true when P is true. So it's true Friday afternoon. Now, they might be occasionally, you know, happening without P being true. There might be traffic without being Friday afternoon, right? Or I may be late without being traffic or without being Friday afternoon. I may be late because I'm lazy or I didn't wake up or I was sick or something like that. So this is, uh, chaining is going to be used in a lot of proofs to get stuff done. From one thing, we get to the next, the next, the next one, so forth. Um, so let me show you some more examples of this. The last piece we need to make proofs uh, is the quantifier. By the way, let me see if I can get the board here. Um, equivalence, that's the one I'm looking for. Equivalence has another name. It has a name if FF guys ever saw that? How do I say it in English? If, if and only if. If and only if. That means equivalent. 
if goes one way, only if goes the other way. So if and only if means equivalent. Now, you don't have to use it. If you like the equivalent sign like me, I'm just gonna use equivalent. Uh, if you like if and only if, you can write that. Some people write same as. Same as means equivalent. That's okay, we can put that in there. Uh, same as. I'm not big on formalism. Whatever works for you guys, if the thinking is correct, that's fine. So, uh, more examples here. Um, so, we, we need two more things to get us started on true mathematics. One is the notion of a predicate. Uh, what number is this? Five? Predicate or property. So I'm going to say E of X is a Boolean variable. It depends on X. So not like before, we have Boolean variables like x, a, b, either true or false. This e of x is like a function. We can call it Boolean function. What it does, it's true or false, but its value depends on who x is. For, for example, e of x is x is even. That's not going to be true for everybody. It's not going to be false for everybody. When is it going to be true? E of number 12 is true, or 1. How about E of 17? False, or 0. Okay. So we need this notion. And number 6, we need the quantifiers, which I already mentioned before a little bit, and I'm sure you've seen it. This means for any, for all, every, everyone, etc. This means there exists, there is one. For now, I'm going to keep informal meanings of those. Eventually, they're going to become more formal. But for now, I really care about the meaning when, when you say something. What does it mean as opposed to exactly a formal definition of these quantifiers? Okay? So we really care about when to use them. Things like, uh, as an example, for every x and y numbers, I'm going to say those are integers. So I say for every integers that have the property even, let's say, is e, e of x and e of y, if they're both even, that implies even the sum. <clears throat> so what is this statement saying? If for any, I should say, for any uh, x, y integers, that are both even, the sum is even. Is that true? Is that a Z or? Z? Yeah. This is the integer set, which is what? 0, 1, minus 1, 2, minus 2, 3, minus 3. So on and so forth. It goes in both directions, the integer set. Natural numbers and their negative counterparts. Is this statement true? If a number is even and another number is even, their sum is even. You should be able to prove that. How about its converse? What is the converse? For any x and y, if this is true if the sum is even, 
the converse would imply both of them. So the converse implies e of x and e of y. If the sum is even, x is even and y is even. Is that true? No. How do we prove that something is not true in the easiest way? It's false, and we give a counterexample. Counterexample. The sum of three and, five. three and five holds is true, but E of three is not true, and E of five is not true. So this is an example where the statement is correct, but the converse is not. Right? I think we're going to have to stop here. I have more stuff for you guys. And we're going to do some tomorrow at the presentation. Tomorrow and Thursday. What is that? Oh, we definitely didn't get it. Okay, who has the sign-in sheet? Because we didn't get it. Yeah. It literally never makes it. Right, <laughs> that could be the goal. Yeah, yeah. I think it's on the going around the side of the side of the side of Only I need to pack up my picture of the picture. And uh, yeah, I think it's in our truck hire. Oh, I've never heard that. Yeah. Attendance sheet, please, where is it? We still never got it. I never got it either. Yeah, it doesn't make no sense. Where is it? I feel like the majority of people don't get the attendance sheet. Well, why are we not moving the attendance sheet around then? Who has it? Somebody's anyway? holding it. Yeah. Who has it? Who is the attendance sheet? Who is it? Yeah, I think it was you. Well, how about we just do it? Forget about the DHS. Yeah, so, what about integration of P implies Q, right? Yeah. So, we just did this on the board. P implies Q is 1 implies 1. And 0 implies anything. Yeah. Right, because 2 does not imply Because you can either think it goes that way. I know what I would do about writing what I was doing. Right, but the same as Either I have a I have a I so this first formalism, it only, I think, helps to write things nicely. Do we need to maybe done it? If my cat is sick, then, you know, I have to go to the doctor. Whatever intuition works. Oh, thank you. This rule is more work when the cat is not sick. The cat is not sick, it doesn't matter. The premise is the cat is sick. So when it's not sick, but when the cat is sick, then you have to go to the doctor. If the cat is sick and you don't go to the doctor, yeah. then it doesn't work. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Um, it, we, it's not part of your grade. So it's, I'm not worried until you, you know. What the reason I need it is because I want to keep track of what happens when you fall behind. So if you really want, I can bring out a station of the previous attendance sheets and you can put the thoughts on them. Sure, I don't mind. So if you do well, or reasonably well, uh, we're not going to count the attendance sheet for anything. It, it doesn't help your grade.